If you set up a workshop at home, there's a couple of things that I could, could mention. I like the center position of your belt grinder to be navel high. So if you're grinding on a wheel or on a plant, you're standing here. Your arms are slightly, your forearms aim slightly downhill. The moment your arms are slightly uphill, you're going to get this juddering happening. I don't know, those of you who are making knives and have either ground on a machine that's too high, or you're trying to move your arms too high, you get this juddering, it like bounces back against your arms, the ground is too high. You move your arms slightly lower, that this angle is no longer horizontal, your hands are lower than your elbow, you find you grind smooth again. And also your water bucket can be mounted on a pivot hinge, or you have two buckets. That when I'm hollow grinding or flat grinding a blade, you know, typically a knife of some sorts, as you grind left handed, you dip on the left. And you grind, you dip this way. That you're never bending down. You know, any unnecessary movements that you make in your workshop just take time. It makes you bend. It's, well, there's a fancy word for that. Some one of the. Of the <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to just blend this up to my lines nicely and uh, then we're going to put on uh, uh, the wheel and I'm going to, to hollow grind these bevels. Once I start grinding the bevels there, I have to check quite regularly because if there are any undulations in the cutting edge, I've got to grind my edge back to center. So that's one of the reasons I like the extra thickness because that allows me to, to grind something. If this was forged too close, then you can't fix it and you'll be left with hammer marks in the blade. So I want this to be nice and true. I want it to be clean. I don't want hammer marks left behind. Slow. About 30 is where I want to run. So three foot to a meter, so 120 feet per second. Is the rough ground speed up? Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to start out really carefully and get my let's pull in the data. The center line, everything must be true before I can start grinding up to the center line here. My edges first, and then the hot grind height. Ah, forgive me. We wanted to angle grind this first. We wanted to knock the fire skirt off that one. How important is not over overheating the blade now to me? And the answer is not, not really important. It's only after this blade has been hardened and tempered that I'm going to take particular care over not heating it. I mean, that tip has turned blue. Now, one doesn't want to intentionally allow it to turn blue, especially down in the main part of the blade. And the only reason for that is it's not, got nothing to do with uh, damaging the steel, but it does put some form of internal stresses in there. And on a very long, slinky, slender blade, you may find that those parts that were overheated during rough grinding mm -hmm. are the parts where a warp is going to reveal itself in the quench. So for that reason, it's, it's best to not intentionally allow it to go blue. But little patches like what just happened here on the tip, I don't care about that. It's not going to do it anymore. Right, so my edges are pretty much straight. Do you see that? OK. A couple of waves in here, working under duress. But anyway, that's, that's the nature of a demo. Close to that one. All right, so my edges are pretty much done. Now it's a matter of getting the center line perfect. And now you're going to see me exciting a lot again, but this time it's looking down the midrib. So I establish my edges first, staying away from the midrib. Now I slowly approach the midrib. Now your thumbs are going to work like push sticks. If I want the edge to grind thinner, my thumbs are going to be there. If I want to grind closer to the spine, 
I want my thumbs towards the spine. It's going to encourage the blade to grind in the direction that I'm pushing. But what you don't want to do is to change the angle of the knife against the wheel, because then you're going to get fastened. You want to just encourage it to grind in the direction you want to go. Not grind a bunch of facets. It mustn't look like a, the top face of a diamond. All these angles and so on. It must be one smooth, uniform surface right across the width of your grind. Okay, that, that is a tricky thing. And, and grinding a blade properly does take practice. One still has to concentrate. You know, I've been doing this for you know, 35 years since a boy. Grinding can still mess up. You lose concentration, you've got to stop and have a rest. Right, let's see what we do. On anybody's machine and grinding. The moment you, or without your jig, you're at a loss. And sometimes those jigs don't work with certain type of blades. You know, you've got a, let's say, a, a Malaysian Chris. How are you going to grind that on a jig? Yeah, so uh, there's going to be challenges that that you will easily overcome once you've had practice in freehand grinding. And and that now is by no means perfect. It's a demo, and um, you know back home you're going to spend way more time getting things just so, but. You know, I haven't put a straight edge up on that center line yet, but visually it looks looks okay. Uh, once that has been heat treated and you start going through finer belts, it's, it's going to get better than that still. Uh, there's a few hammer marks yet, but rather than grind that too thin now, I will rather leave it thicker and grind it a bit later. There's a little saying in a blacksmith book that we've got at home. It's over a hundred years old. But it says, He who will a good edge win, will forge it thick and grind it thick. So in other words, I mean, there's heat treat in between there. But you don't forge it thin. Because then there's nothing to grind. You forge it thin, there's all that carbon loss and carbon burnout and scale and hammer marks and all that kind of stuff to deal with. By forging it thick, it is not the same as being rough and ugly and expect to stop remove all your mistakes out. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But leave everything oversized and uh, tidy it up with the grinding after all. Now, I'm going to hand file the shoulders just a little bit. There's some very specific notches that you'll find on the originals. Right here. Can you see those little notches? We haven't quite... Sorry, I moved as you picked the button. Yeah, so all the original Asagai blades have got this strange little notch right in the corner there. We haven't figured out the purpose, whether it was tooling or what that made that, but they've all got it. Uh, even this one. Now this, Heather will explain I think a little bit further, but we see a lot of new faces from this morning. That's the, the throwing spear and that's the stabbing spear. This was on a, on a long slender shaft standing probably out to that tall, taller than a person. And then, and that being the shaft. In the form of heat and light from itself, and that's why the steel cools down. Um, and you observe that in the forge as a sudden dip in the temperature. Steel goes dark. The moment that shadow disappears and has sort of equalized in temperature with the background of your forge, let's say that the steel has become camouflaged with the forge. Now, if your forge is set correctly, you don't want to set your fire too hot. The biggest enemy of our of heat treat now is overheating. Overheating is going to cause, firstly, as I said now, the, the, the cracking. But 
Now now is a South African word, by the way. Just now, a little while ago. <laughs> um, but, uh, sorry, we're going to have to try this book now, but I've got Overheating. Yeah, overheating. So, the overheating is going to cause the cracking in the first sense, but also it's going to cause the grain structure of that steel to enlarge. And the whole purpose of our heat and of our normalizing procedure before the hardening was to refine the grain. The grain structure was enlarged because of the high forging temperatures. We have repaired the grain structure now to go and overheat the blade just before the quench negates all that effort you've gone to for normalizing. So one's got to be really careful uh, with your, your, your temperatures that you, you choose here. So uh, there's a couple of things that we can do to make our uh, judgment of color better. We're going to use the magnet, of course. The first thing we're going to do is to turn the lights off. How do we do that? I got it. Okay. After that, you're going to shut all the doors. Now, I don't want to exclude everyone who's sitting outside, so we're not going to do that. But you want to work in the dimly lit workshop. Okay? I like to do my heat treat in the late afternoon to evening as the sun is going down. And, and you, you don't want to work in heat treated blade. One day, the sun is blazing through the door, and the next day, you've moved your forge outside. and you know, to try and get things as consistent as possible because if you can get used to the way things are, the moment you start adding variables, there's enough variables here as it is. The oil temperature, the temperature of the forge, what steel we're we using, the, you know, there's just so much that, that can change that the light and your, your vision is something that you've at least got some control of. So I'm going to set this forge down just a little bit lower that pressure. I'm again running it close to 5 psi. Uh, 5 psi just starts to back burn up this burner a little bit. That's what I was hoping it would do. It's a medium quench speed that I've been told, I forget the name, the brand names here I'm unfamiliar with. Most of you are familiar with this workshop, do you know? Do you know? Right, now before I... I'm going to put this tang in the fire first. Now I've got a cold section way back here. So I'm going to put the tip of the tang into this region with this heavy section here close to a burner, but not directly under the burner itself. I don't want the hot flame straight onto my blade. So the tip of the blade is out. Being thin, it can overheat real easy, so I'm going to protect that. The tip of the tang, I'm not going to heat treat anyway, so that's in the cold zone within the bricks here. So once that thick, heavy section where that wide blade starts has started to give me some color then I'm going to turn it around and let, allow the tip of the blade to come up. Once again my, my forge temperature is, is set just hot enough to give me the temperature I need. I don't want this thing screaming hot. If your forge is running way, way over temperature the chances there are that the thin sections of your blade are going to reach temperature first while the thick, heavy sections are still too cold, it's very good. So you want your forge set as close to the correct hardening temperature as possible. That way the risk of overheating the thin sections has been minimized.
Let's hope it doesn't do it again. I'll increase that pressure just a little bit. Is there a name for that? It's back burning, I suppose you call it. It's just burning up the, up the tube. It's burning up to the, the jet right here. Now, with a self-aspirated forge like that, you can get get away from that by allowing the forge to breathe easier. It's going to suck in easy and expel gas easy. If I was to open this door and allow some sort of free access, it's, it's like uh, polishing the valves and putting a free flow exhaust pipe on the on a car, which is a good thing. But on the forge, you want to throttle this back just a little bit. The less air you get, in a way, the better it is. You've got to have enough air to get a good burn. But it's an excess of air that's going to cause fire scaling and carbon burnout, decarburize, all the bad things. So, so I like to, to shut this airflow down. And if it's spluttering like that, I can deal with that. One can do some stuff like flaring the nozzles of your burner and you know, giving them a slight cone. Uh, it just increases that venturi effect, the way that the, the draft of air is drawn in and expelled out the other side. By creating a nozzle at the tip, it makes a low pressure zone right there where the flame comes out, causing you know, a, a, a draft in the right direction. You said that the oil was a about 200 degrees Fahrenheit? Yeah, it's probably a little bit on the hot side. It sounds like kind of hot. You live about what, 95, 97 centigrade? It's original. Yeah. I mean, it sounds hot from somebody sick your finger in it. It's 100, it's 100 degrees. It's hot. Yeah, so it's a little bit on the hot side. Um, I'm hoping that. Some of the cold stuff at the bottom will do its thing. But providing that the, temp the oil temperature is less than the temperate temperature that I want. Now I'm wanting a spring temper on this, on this particular blade, which in degree C is going to be about 300. What's that in Fahrenheit? 475 or more. Uh, somebody can work it out. Um, you know, spring yeah. temper is close to 300 degrees, so if I'm quenching into 100 here, that's good. Because I never, if I quench it and I allow this blade to get too cold, that's when cracking becomes a risk again. What is 300 C? I'm trying to get there. What is 300 degrees centigrade in Fahrenheit? It's 572 degrees Fahrenheit. 500 what? 572. So that's what we'll be wanting to temper this blade at. I'm looking for my magnet now, right? Now when we go to the quench, we want to have gloves on. Because there's always a chance that that oil catches fire. I did burn myself one time. I had hot fire and I didn't want to let go because I've got a steel quenching pipe and I've let my blade go pull all the way to the bottom then the tip to save the blade and burn my hand Alright, that is beautiful carefully now, I don't want to overheat it. It does look darker than it should look in the dark. If the workshop was gloomy, that would be visually glowing more. Not that it would be hotter, it's just you would see it as a bigger glow. Right now it looks pretty dark. You don't want this thing to be in this light, bright orange. Test 
process it quickly. Don't, don't take that whole blade out of the forge. Go and look for a magnet. By the time you touch it, it's cooled down. It's going to be non-magnetic, but it may have been correct, but now it's, you've just waited too long. This is a long blade, and to get that whole blade evenly heated over its entire length is what's going to be tricky. I'm going to crank up the pressure just a little bit, move the blade backwards and forwards more. You know, more quickly. Alright, that looks beautiful and even. One last check here where it's a little darker and that looks, felt, felt good with the magnet. I don't see any shadows down the length of the blade. I'm going to go now. Are you ready? to where my quench needs to be hard. Now if I give that a good count of 8 or 10, take it out while it's still smoky like that, that's a good thing. I'll tell you what temperature that blade is now. It's not going to crack so easily because it's hot. If you left that in there and your oil was cold and you allowed it to come all the way down to room temperature just in one go, the chances are that it could very easily crack. Once I can handle that 
blade. I'm going to just run it over the belt grinder very quickly, only to remove the black colouring. And then I'm going to flame temper it right here in front of the forge, which because this is a spear and we are wanting a spring temper is a convenient way to do that. The Rockwell hardness is not hyper, hypercritical. If it were a knife blade and we were shooting for 58 or 59 Rockwell, you would want to temper it in an oven. Okay, with that, that Rockwell as far as the cutting ability is, is very important to get right. So you would want to temper that at what are you guys using? 375, something like that. Um, and obviously that temperature is going to differ with whatever steel you use. Right? Different alloys, different carbon contents. You, know, you need to know your steel. Um, so by me just grinding the black fire scale off of my blade, turning the, the bevels nice and shiny, when I wave this knife in front of the the, the, the opening of the forge, I just need to get that blue oxide. And this is probably the way that medieval blades and so forth would have been heat, uh, tempered. Just with a flame. You don't stick it inside the forge. It just, you know, it would have been waved over the coals, or would it be charcoal or, or coal. Putting that in water, that's, that wouldn't be clever. If it would cool down a little bit more, you know, just that last bit that I can handle it easily, then I will. But while water is still sizzling on its surface, I wouldn't want to put it in the bucket. Oh, that's, that's still sizzling water. So we'll just let that cool down for a little bit more. You guys familiar with the typical tempering graphs that you'll get from your steel suppliers? So I draw that just for a moment. Every steel will have a very typical graph looks like this. It starts out, and you guys see, not everyone will be able to see. Okay. On this axis, yeah, axis here, yeah, you've got Rockwell. The symbol is RC. This is Rockwell on the C scale. There are other scales, B scale. It's called hard measuring the hardness of softer metals. So we are using the C scale and the symbol is R for Rockwell C scale. Sometimes you'll find it with a capital H in front as well. That's hardness, Rockwell C. On this scale here, you've got the tempering temperatures. The higher you temper it, the more the Rockwell falls off. So you've got to now pinpoint what Rockwell you're wanting and read off the temperature, whatever that might be. It's quite a simple thing to follow. But where, what I'd like to share with you, those of you who are interested to learn more about this, this graph very often is kind of horizontal to start with, starts to fall, and then all of a sudden like drops off almost vertically. Now, for this steel, which is alloy X, you know, it's a, it's a, a, a generic steel that I'm drawing it for here. This here is this steel's sweet spot. You want to work in any hard, a rock wheel hardness in this zone. You don't want to work here, and you don't want to work here. The reason for that is working this steel.
feel in this rock or hard zone is too hard for that steel. It hasn't been sufficiently tempered. Okay, you do want to temper your blades. So if you get a blade, that's for argument's sake, say it comes out of the oil at 62 Rockler, and you want a really hard knife. Don't choose this particular steel because you know it comes out at 62 Rockler out of the oil. You want to temper it. It's happy at about 58, 59, something like that. If you're wanting a 62 Rockler, rather choose a different steel with a higher carbon content. It's going to come out of the oil maybe at 65. And by the time you've tempered it, it's 62. Now you're going to be working in the sweet spot of that particular steel. Does that make sense? Okay, in this zone here, the graph is so vertical, it's unpredictable. Small changes in the tempering temperature here can either put you down here or way up here. So the rockwell hardnesses are not easily, you, you can't easily obtain the, the hardness you want. Unless you start tempering it on the low side and slowly, slowly sneak up onto your temperature with multiple temper cycles, testing it along the way. As long as you're too hard, you can increase your tempering, tempering temperature and the rock will slowly fall down until you are at the hardness you want. Okay, so. If you're wanting a high rock world, you use another steel that has a different curve that might be somewhere there. But 62 rock world will temper at a different temperature. Okay, that's just a little bit of theory there. Often guys are wanting blades too hard out of a steel that is not comfortable at the hardness that they have left it. In 5160, this spear, if we were to test that, that's likely to be 62 Rockwell. But I'd hate to make a knife from 5160 and leave it at 62 Rockwell. It's just too hard for that steel. This is a design as a spring steel. It's meant to be in that springy, tough zone. Okay, let's, I'll, just, I'll tell you what temperature this is for now. Yes, close to boiling point. So I'm going to see the water's very, 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 that part is not, not boiling water at all. Let's 
shiny, because by the time we go in front of the flames, we can uh, see the oxide colors. Are you guys familiar with those colors? I'm sure you are. Anyone who's heated steel will know that polished steel goes through a rainbow of colors as it increases in temperature. Those colors are directly related to temperature. So first you're going to get those very pale straw. You know, it's like barely golden. As that straw turns to a darker and darker straw, you're going to get a bronze brown. Bronze brown is already very tough. It starts to lose that hardness, but it is still hard enough for a lot of blades. Bronze brown is a nice color for these big daggers and flat swords and stuff like that. I'm going to temper this to blue, which is just a little bit hotter. Now I'm going to start with the thickest part of this blade. Let me just get my tongue sorted. Right, so I'm just going to play this, this area here over the flames to start with. And I'd like to just use that to verify temperatures and I'll, I'll give you a running commentary. Once we start getting pretty colors, those of you with videos, if you want to come and get a nice shot of the colors, you're welcome to do that. Now realize the thin parts of the blade will heat up first. So it might, might happen that the, the cutting edges have reached that peacock blue, but the spine might be bronze. And I'm going to be happy with that. Right, I'm halfway between freezing and boiling point. Once again, we just take it easy. It would be easy to just stick this in the fire and overheat anything. Right, I'm starting to turn color on the tank here. Do you see that? See, that's no longer silver. There's a little bit of blue happening there. Right? That dark blue turning into the bronze brown and golden. See that? As I'm talk, talking, that, that color is running down into the tang there. So those oxide colors are directly related to temperature. There we go. It's starting to get some lovely color there. Ooh, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to just zap it. One seventy-five is kind of what I'm getting in centigrade. Just to 300. In your language. <laughs> now to go much beyond the dark blue and into sky blue might be a little on the softer side than I'd like. I'm estimating for 5160 at this at this tempo we're going to be around 50 rock maybe 45 do you have any questions with regards to the heat treat so far yeah who is that over here yeah go for it yeah you want your center soft for the edge that's right uh, it might be nice if we could do that, but this, this method won't allow that. In fact, the, the center is going to be harder. But harder means stiffer at the same time. So, this, sorry? With this uh, style, you know, the point blade there, can just let itself do temper on a hot chunk of steel or with the torch? Yeah, 
now you get a similar, you see what's happening, you see, this is what I was saying right in the beginning, the thin edges are turning blue before the, the center midrib. See that? So, whether you're using a hot plate or a, or a torch, you're going to heat up the thin parts first, irrespective. So, uh, I'm not sure you're going to get anything different. But what is important is that you take your time over this. You don't want to rush this. It's very easy for the thin parts to become too hot, and then they're soft. And the only way to fix that is to go all the way back to the hardening process where we put in the oil and water all over again. So. Brown, speckled, and dark blue, that's, that's good. How would you get it softer in the middle if you wanted to? Right? How would you? Yeah. I would say clay hardening would be a good choice. It would be untraditional for this piece, but uh, packing clay down is the midroom and uh, Quench, you know, heating it up until the edges are hot enough, quenching it in oil, hardening the edge. Right, so there we have a beautiful peacock blue. Now one might lightly grind that oxide off again, and go through that whole tempering process again, double temper. You see you've got patches of brown, bronze, between the blue, the next cycle, those patches would be in different places, and by the time you've done it two, maybe three times, the overall hardness would be quite uniform. And in the old days, you know, European swords and so forth, you want to focus on that? European swords and stuff, I don't think so, you'd be right. <laughs> uh, they spoke about blue blades. Would have been sold for him, not sold, given to the, the soldiers in this condition. So when you um, you went when you hardened that and you brought it out, you said it was 450. Um, that was Fahrenheit, I assume. Yeah. Um, wouldn't that almost be the same color? Close to. You know, they refer to that as auto tempering. By taking a blade out that's hot, it tempers itself with its own retained heat. So providing the blade is taken out the oil and it measures a temperature lower than the temperature I ideally want to temper it, it's still good. Oh, that's what you prefer yeah. to that. Yeah. But did that make sense? Yes. Yeah, so you can temper a blade to a degree just by the heat it possesses by taking it out of the oil sooner. Yeah. But that often can count, it can work against you just as easily as it can. So, so this temperature is above the 450 that you're at yes. now? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, 300 C is, oh. is okay. somebody did that earlier, I forget the temperature. 572. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, and where he measured it was in a thick area, and I think the thick area was hotter, and then the thin area was colder. So what he just did was even the temper out. Because I agree with you, at 450, you'd have Should I do this again? Temper. Do you want to watch this uh, temper again? It's 200 degrees, so that tip is probably 200 degrees. So the tip needs to be tempered down. Yeah, I'll do it exactly the same as before. Now, once it's been tempered, one can put it in water a lot safer than straight out of the heat treat because it's no longer brittle. But I still am hesitant to give that steel a big fright. So I'll just do it gently. Now, if you're going to retemper it, does it really matter if you watch it now? I can say, the steel is not. I'm brittle anymore. So if I 
Yeah. If I read Quenchen, you mean now? No word. Yeah, that is not. Well, if you were going to read Templars anyway, the demonstration, if you did it once, pull it out of there, got a temper right, and then just punched it hot, what if you read Templars, you'd be back. Yeah, but you know, I'm going to grind it, so I'm going to hold it to my hands. So you, you need to be able to hold it in your hands anyway. Um, yeah, so I'm losing my train of thought. But tempering it, putting it in the water, is not going to harm the blade now. Yeah. 